Thank you guys, you're, you're a treasure. Do you like cereals? Maria, yes. <laughs> That's coming <laughs> my age, isn't it? I used to love them. This was, they, were, they were good. And you got used to the characters and you knew. Well, today it's not a cereal, but it's a continuation of when I was up here last about eight weeks ago. So I'm sure you're going to remember every detail of what I said, but that is, of course, can't be the case. I'll just do a quick review of where we left it off last time I was here. The disciples had been sent out to do their homework, and they came back after their practice and wanted to talk to Jesus about all the stuff that they'd gone through during that time. Jesus had just heard of the tragic death of his cousin, uh, John, John the Baptist. And uh, I guess we all experience, as Neb was saying today, uh, the loss of loved ones, and uh, we've just experienced that in our family, of a cousin and a loved one. So now we pick up the story when Jesus informs the disciples that you feed them. So we're just going to look at that scripture. Thank you. And uh, we'll just briefly rehash where we've left off. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a very solitary place. Hearing this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. Now Jesus landed and saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the village and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, you do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have only some bread and some fish, they said. And then Jesus asked for it. And so taking the loaves and the fish, He blessed it. <clears throat> Do you think when the disciples heard Jesus say, you feed them, that was what they had expected? I think after they got their jaws up off the ground and did a quick calculation, they would have figured out that it would have cost them to feed 5,000, and the scriptures say 5,000 men, and it also had a little plus sign after that, plus women and children. So you could assume probably there was about 7,000 people there, wouldn't you say? And so they, they did a quick calculation at a denarii a day would be the day's labour, which would be to the equivalent of about $50 today. Uh, it would have cost something like 200 denarii just to feed the mob. But Jesus wanted to know what food was there. And so he said, is there any food? And they said, yeah, we've got this little guy here who's got five loaves of barley loaves and it was very coarse grain that they'd used and uh, it was cheap. And two small fish that this boy was given for the day. And I was thinking, Gosh, he must have been good on the tooth to eat five loaves of bread and two fish himself. <laughs> Gosh, he, he's doing all right. And then Jesus holds up the bread and the fish and he blesses it. 
That's the way that any rabbi would. And the people would have expected that. Because he would have prayed something similar like, Blessed art thou, O God, the King of the universe, who brought forth bread from the earth, we thank you. Something similar to that. And so to avoid the cross, he ordered then the disciples to put them in groups of 30 and he handed the fish to the disciples who had some baskets because they were fishermen and they were putting, put the fish in the baskets. But as the fish was distributed, it multiplied. Again, a wonderful miracle. And you know, something similar happens when after the resurrection they had been out fishing and saw Jesus on the shore cooking a meal. What was it he was cooking? Fish. So guess what? My favourite meal is Fish and, Fish and chips. You can't get there. It's biblical. <laughs> you know, talking about Jesus multiplying that fish, sometimes we think we haven't got anything to give. Sometimes we, have, we think that, what have I got to offer the church to the Lord? I've got nothing much. My talents are few and I can't do very much by health. But you know what? The Lord wants you to give to him what you have. Because then he's going to multiply. He's going to multiply for his good. Being, as we said, fish of people, the disciples, there was plenty of baskets, and so they made sure that there wasn't going to be any waste. And so they collected what was left over to fill up about 12 baskets, which they were going to take back to Capernaum with them. But remember now, this is still the same day. That's why I call this the longest day. It is still the same day after it all had happened in the morning. And so they get into the boat, the disciples, to take the load to Capernaum. And the crowds, they'd come from everywhere. They'd come from the villages, they'd come from the towns, they'd come from their homes, They'd come from their labour, come the fields, and they came because of Jesus. They wanted to be with him. Now, they had been physically healed. They had been physically fed. And they had been spiritually fed. Now he sent them home because even though they wanted to be with him and clamoured to be with him, he sent them home because he didn't want to give them the security that they were looking for. They didn't understand his spiritual purpose and reason for being. He, on the other hand, refused to become a political opportunist. He would not promote his kingdom by organising a revolt against the existing powers by promising a dole to all who enlist under his banner. Warren Wisby made that claim. So now we look at Matthew 14, 22 to 33, and we'll just follow the story just uh, very briefly. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. Then when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, 
They were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, it's you, Peter replied. Tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. Cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed back into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. He sent the disciples out in the boat to go to Capernaum. So when the disciples got that message and got in the boat, it was only a short distance across from Bethsaida to Capernaum. It would be a bit of a dole. Their fishermen, after all, wasn't going to be a problem. The Romans divided the hours between sunset and sunrise as watches. And it was now the fourth watch, which was around three, between 3 and 6 a.m. in the morning. The Sea of Galilee is about 600 feet below sea level, and it's in a cup, a cup-like depression between the hills. And when the sun sets and the cool air then rises, and then the air from the west rushes in down the hills onto the water, then that results in a churning up of the lake. As they were heading over to the other side, the disciples were heading into the wind. I guess as they were rowing and heading into the wind, the sails would have been down, and they were rowing like crazy. I suppose John would have loved to have said to Peter, Hey, Pete, it's time to crank up the 40 horsepower Johnson. <laughs> that wasn't going to be the case, was it? The swell was really heavy. The swell was so bad that it was nearly swamping the boat. And Jesus had gone to this quiet place to pray. What a wonderful lesson. Here's the same day Jesus had been on the go from early morning and yet he found time to pray to his Father. The swell was really heavy. And so as Jesus comes down now to the edge of the water and he sees them, he knew they were in trouble. Have you ever been out, say, on Pumperstone Passage and a swell gets up and you're there in a tinny? I have. <laughs> you know what it's like when you're rowing? And you've got a fixed point on your left as you're rowing and you're heading into the swell. And you can row for ten minutes and you haven't even passed it. <laughs> I guess Jesus saw that the disciples were doing the same. They were getting nowhere. So... When Jesus saw this happening, he makes a lovely gesture. You know, he could have sent angels down to their aid. He could have raised his hand and stopped the wind and the tempest and everything like that. But he chose to help them in the most loving way. He came himself. He came himself. You know, when we face storms of life as we go through each day, when we have to face really difficult situations, when we trace our health and job and children situations, they're difficult. Sometimes it's like a storm of life. And yet Jesus said to us, because... We're Christians, we're not going to be exempt from all that. In John 16, he said, in the world you will have tribulation. He loves to come to us. 
doesn't he? He loves to come to us in our extremities. He loves to come to us when we're really battling the winds and the storms of life to reassure us. He reassures us of his abiding love and presence will see us through. Have you ever done anything really scary? Or have you ever been really, really scared? I had one occasion at one time. I didn't want to be a wuss. The friends I was with, he's a fisherman. He said, oh, I know this great place. He said, we go down the side of this cliff and you throw in from there. Well, the path that we walked down the side was no wider than this pulpit. And I'm carrying the fishing gear and you had to stand with your back against the wall. I was frightened to throw out in case I fell over. <laughs> but I wasn't going to let him know. <laughs> I wanted to be cool, but I was shaking the whole time. I was glad to get back. So, yeah, scared I was. When Jesus walks across the water, do you think the disciples would have been scared? <laughs> it wouldn't matter. I mean, any of us would have been scared seeing somebody appearing out of the gloom like a ghost or a spectre. And you know, when Jesus did that, he knew they were going to be scared out of their wits. So he did the most reassuring thing he could do. He spoke to them. He spoke to them. Doesn't that speak volumes? Those of us who have loved ones that have been out coming home it's a storm. It's really bad when out there on the road. They're caught up. They should have been home an hour ago. What are you looking for? What are you waiting for? What is it that you, all you want to do is to hear their voice? <coughs> hear their voice. Days before the mobile phones, it was a little bit more difficult, wasn't it? But if they could get to a phone somewhere in Ringy, you were so reassured. You were so happy. You know, it doesn't matter what age you are. I love to hear it when Carolyn lets me know she's home. <laughs> because why? We, we worry, don't we? We worry about loved ones. But he said to them, take courage. Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. And he said it to them in Greek. It is I. It is I. The Greek means I am. I am. He reassured them again after the resurrection when he said the same. I am. I love um, those of us who, who like to, to get involved in, in reading and studying. Matthew Henry. You guys probably know him too. He's a wonderful commentator of the couple of centuries ago. But he said this, The church is often like a ship at sea, like the disciples, tossed from tempest and storms, and not comforted. We may have Christ for us, and yet winds and tides against us. But it's a comfort in Christ, and in crises like the disciples that the master in the heavenly moment enters into an interceding form. But you know, it was foretold. Yep, it was foretold by Job 9 verse 8 where he said, He alone spreads out the heavens and treads the waves of the sea. Peter, peering through the gloom, says, Lord, if it's you, I want to come to you. And Jesus said simply, come. The scriptures tell us that Peter, the passionate, Peter the extrovert, Peter the impulsive, Peter, the man of action. Deeds before thought. 
Peter, caught up in the moment, went over the side of the boat and walked to the Lord. This, to me, was one of the most defining moments in the story of Jesus and his mission here on earth. And whatever followed can never undo that act of blind faith and trust. You know, we can find fault with Peter for many things. But you know what? No one else in that boat attempted to do what he did. No one else. Now, if you were in the boat, place yourself in that situation. Here we have the tempest raging. The boat was rocking, lashed with winds, howling. It was dark. It was cold. Would you leave the safety and the comfort of the boat? Put your feet over the side and go with people. Probably if it was me, I would have said, I could have rationalised it by saying, well, Pete's gone to him, so that's good. Someone has, eh, boys? When Peter went over the side of that boat, when his feet hit that water, he didn't know whether he would sink to the bottom with the heavy clothes that he had on. It would have been very likely that he would have gone straight to the bottom. And even fishermen in those days couldn't swim. We don't know whether Peter could have swum. But it never entered his mind. He was now walking on the water to his master. He wanted nothing more than to be with him. And he loved him. I would rather try and fight than never do anything he fought. Peter only started to think when his eyes turned off Jesus and noticed the chaos that was going on around him. And at that point, Jesus reached out his hand. Reached out his hand and pulled him up. In verse 31. So, what can I glean from this story? It's only when we have such a burning desire as Peter to be with Jesus and to know him more and to understand him more, to desire his presence over and over all other priorities. Yes, we may not always do as we should, but we don't stop trying because that is success. Jesus reached out his hand. He's offering that same hand to us today. Do we want to take it? But you know what? The true success of this story is not in the stilling of the storm. It's not in Jesus and Peter walking on the water. It's not in feeding 5,000. It's not in healing the sick. But it's in verse 33. In verse 33 is the whole secret of this story and the whole reason why it's here. The worship, the confession of the disciples. Truly, you are the Son of God. This was such a breakthrough moment for Jesus. This was the first time that Jesus had ever heard him being addressed by the disciples with his full name and his full title. You know, in Mark 16, verse 16, it says, Jesus says, Anyone who believes and is baptised will be saved. So what is asked of a candidate? When that point of baptism comes and before you baptise them into the water, you ask them this question, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God and your personal Saviour? That same response the disciples made to Jesus 
on that boat. Now, I don't know how you, you would uh, approach things if you were on that boat. I don't know whether you would change what you were going to do or what you wanted to do. I don't know whether you would think differently of Peter because he did that. But I'm sure you would have been changed by that event. You would have been changed. The longest day had now moved into the early hours of the next day. It began with the news of a death and it ended up with a diminishing of the old way of thinking and a renewing of the understanding and the enlightenment of the disciples of their Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Jesus may be waiting to walk on the waters of our lives. He asked us the same question. Come, I want to walk that walk with you. Will you be brave enough to climb out of the safety and the comfort of the boat of your life? If anything that you remember from this time together this morning, I would hope it's a little more than the fact that Ron loves fish and chips. <laughs> Thanks, Joe.